The Tuning Fork, setting the tone for cultural activism through weekly encounters with cultural activists worldwide, live on ICAI, Institute for Cultural Activism International. Um, Emily, is this the part where the producer tells uh, John to start the meeting? Is this it? Roland. Right. <laughs> I guess that's it. We've started. Um, well, it's been a while since we've been um, on a Tuning Fork uh. live broadcast. Our last guest was Alex Winter, the actor and uh, film director. Uh -huh. So, Fred, thank you for being our esteemed sure. guest, episode 42. Wow. My pleasure. Um, I just want to note that this is the 42nd episode. Emily and I began the tuning fork as a sort of uh, safe place to meet during COVID, during the lockdown. Uh -huh. And uh, the idea was to create a very comfortable and familiar space for people to get together. At that time, it was on a weekly basis, Fred. Mm -hmm. So I think between 2020 uh, we began with Ann Waldman, the poet um, and cultural activist, self-described cultural activist, by the way. Um, and we did it every week during the lockdown. Hmm. And then we tapered off to once a month as lockdown eased. Mm -hmm. And Emily and I began to travel to Europe, uh, immediately to Italy, where we were met by Margaret Vimmer eventually, and we produced a number of community events, huh. sort of elaborating this idea of, of community uh, gathering, but Thanks. doing it on the street oh. through um, immersive, immersive performance art events. Uh -huh. So since August, Fred, we've been occupied with our biweekly Tuning Fork radio show. <laughs> and yours is the first show of 2024. And I, I personally couldn't be more ecstatic and thrilled and rewarded. Um, Emily's the producer. And as you can see, there's some lovely flowers behind her. Um, <laughs> that's our front porch. <laughs> oh, nice. And Fred, we invite you, of course, to come and visit us and perhaps Certainly. bring some work with you that we can share oh. with <laughs> Yes, very, very diverse, diverse community in in Delhi. Ah, nice at the SUNY Delhi. Uh huh. Oh, cool. Um, it's so thrilling that um, Fred and Aviva and I went to college together, and that's a while ago, in 1972. We began. I think uh, quite amazing that there were only 40 students at the time admitted right. to the visual arts department out of. 800 applicants. That's right. <laughs> so what, what did we do right? I don't know. Did you apply to any other schools, Fred, besides SUNY Purchase? Uh, just, yeah. I think it was just a couple. SVA? Uh, no. Uh, Cooper Union. Oh, Cooper. Which, yeah. Did, uh, they, did they accept you? No. <laughs> uh, Okay, so <laughs> and I'm quite happy <laughs> that they didn't. Haka was there at the time, wasn't he? I guess so. I don't know. Was he? Yeah, I think he was. Did you ever connect with him, Hans Haka? Oh yeah, years later we became good friends, I, and uh, yeah, but uh, and I I guess I taught it a couple of times at uh, Cooper. Maybe either filling in for him or someone else. Yeah. Oh, good. So, that yeah. sounds great. That sounds so, fun. Yeah. Um, I want to welcome Margaret Vibmer from Amsterdam, our partner and, oh, and um, collaborator and board member. There's Margaret. Uh, greetings, Margaret. Uh, people are just going to be, you know, dropping in, Fred, during the. Oh, talk. okay. And um, it's kind of like a. Oh, yeah. We, there are more we, people there. We, we've tried to um, sustain this sort of comfortable dining room feeling, you know, um, 
but not to um, dismiss the importance of uh, scholarship and sharing methodology and um, hopefully nurturing cultural activism internationally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I might call out to people coming in that we know, but um, please everyone feel welcome. And the way that our format is, is that we speak with Fred for about uh, 60 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. We were already burned up six minutes and uh, <laughs> warming up the internet together. And and yeah. we have a PowerPoint to share also. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Em. Yeah. And uh, we're live on YouTube and Facebook Live and also today for the first time on Instagram. Hello, Instagram uh, community. <laughs> so um, a lot of people will have benefit of this um, contact with your work, Fred. Tuning mm -hmm. Fork obviously represents this opportunity to resonate with your mind, yeah. with the instruments of your work, um, and uh, to interact with you um, personally after about uh, 60 minutes of the show. Okay. People can, Great. all of our friends here around the world and in the United States, Ron Smith is in, Is it? I always forget, is it Cambridge? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and um, yeah, there's Jude Ray, up in uh, near Rhinebeck and oh. Sally Harris in Minnesota. Aviva's in Sunnyside, Queens. Isabel Kata is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Hmm. Um, Renee Bouchard in uh, southwestern Vermont. And um, everybody live out there on the, the um, <laughs> Metasphere. Great. I think Dan Cameron just um, said hi. I think oh, that's nice. In. He's just sent me a text message. Lots of love to you, Fred, from Meredith Monk. Oh, that's so sweet. She's on a plane to New Mexico. Uh -huh. uh, I think she has a retreat house there. You know, she's a oh. Buddhist. Oh. And uh, she does have a retreat house out, out there, I know. Iris Khan and Kim Do send their love. They're, oh, that's great. They're, they're yeah. on the highway. They're going oh, to try really? to tune in on you know, Route 87. <laughs> I'm coming south from Woodstock area oh, oh, and uh, cool. Ron Rocco it's like one o'clock in the morning for him oh, in oh of course uh, Victoria Vesna is now over there in Milan New York I think no not yet but on the east coast at least <laughs> and um, let's see Hans Hacke yeah sublime trauma okay I'm just by the way, Fred, have yeah. you seen um, American Fiction? No. With Jeffrey Wright. Oh, no, I haven't. I think it'll blow you away. All right, cool. Yeah. I'll look for that one. It's just, He's great. Um, He's terrific. Oh, my God, yeah. And I had the sublime privilege of, privilege of um, speaking with Jeffrey back in somewhere in the beginning of the 21st century oh. at the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh-huh. And he sort of downloaded in a very passionate way the status of the African-American uh -huh. uh, in terms of um, the frequency and um, percentage of young black men who were imprisoned. Oh, well, yes. Uh, oh. You know, um, yeah. and, and Puerto Ricans and people of color. Mm -hmm. And uh, here Jeffrey is now, you know, um, nominated for an Academy Award. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, Fred, as we only have a, a short amount of time, um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, and Emily, too. Sure. But, um, but John, do you want to also share the PowerPoint? Um, I see or, on, my, on my monitor that we have about 27 images. Uh, okay. Why don't we wait about 20 minutes before doing that, Em? Okay. And then we can just, you know, move through them. We can move through them. Mm -hmm. people, okay. People, people can have a little context. We have a little context uh, right. to see them. And um, just uh, if, uh, thank you, Emily, for that. Um, Fred, I was thinking about uh, when you were a young man, a young boy, perhaps, you had um, the unfortunate... Uh, experience of being discriminated 
uh, somehow I read that, is it true that you guys moved to Westchester County? Yes, after yeah. living, uh, born in the Bronx, living in Brooklyn, and then to Westchester for elementary school. Oh, wh where were you in Westchester? Uh, Yonkers, the sort of suburban part of Yonkers, which was just a lot of kind of uh, open fields and, and a small uh, community of homes. <laughs> really nice. Well, yeah. it was a nice place. And did, did you feel in some way the sort of social context of... of uh... Well, you know, I was, I was just, I was so young. And uh, so I was the only black kid in the school, uh, in the neighborhood, uh, et cetera. So I was, you know, I was different, but um, I, I, I was all, but the thing is I was always different in various ways. So it was that I didn't fit in, uh, but uh, that would have been power for the course if I was in the Bronx also, but in, just in a different way. Uh, of course, I didn't know, know that, but, but it was just, but, you know, I had a good friend, uh, a few, but one that you know, Iris Khan. She and I went to elementary school together. Uh, and so even though I didn't have a plethora of friends, because I was not good in sports or didn't really care about it, uh, that was, in, I guess, most boys in a lot of schools, that's the center of their their recreational life. And that was not mine. Yeah. So that that was not uh, of interest to me, and I wasn't bothered by it at all. It just meant I was kind of, kind of a people. Everybody knew me and, and liked me, but I was pretty much a loner. But we had a huge house and a big backyard, so I uh, I basically was able to kind of be myself and uh, and sort of uh, in in the woods and things like that. It wasn't. You know, the, the city gives gives you other benefits and uh, and other issues, and so, you know, in hind, I really was happy to leave Westchester, uh, but in hindsight, it was uh, kind of a considering the kind of boy I was, the kind of best environment uh, for me. There was no outright. Uh, racism or anything like that or everybody was oh. young and and so it didn't have anything happen along those lines i was just the, the different one you know so uh you know so it was really minor it wasn't whatever topics came up or ideas or thoughts it was uh very like naive naive stuff and the only other the only thing i remember is i was walking down the hill to the to the school and uh this boy who was, I guess, you know, was older than me, probably in maybe in junior high school, he stopped me. And I, of course, obviously everyone knew me. I didn't know everybody because you know, I stood out. And he said, uh, what did he say? Oh gosh, it was kind of fun, funny. He says, uh, he looked at me and said, uh, is Sonny listening to your father? And uh, just making a joke. And I said, yes. And he all of a sudden stopped. <laughs> <laughs> it was the smartest thing I ever, I, could, I ever, I ever did. <laughs> he I, backed I off it. and was gone. <laughs> I was hoping that that was your reply. Yeah. <laughs> but I, from this, from this um, sort of, uh, I don't mean to say this in any kind of an, um, presumptuous way, but, you know, or arrogant way, but sometimes when we're discriminated, we have this um, opportunity <clears throat> to look into the mind of those who are discriminating mm -hmm. and to recognize this, this mega structure of the hierarchy mm -hmm. and how it works. And um, I wonder when you were a kid, it, it sounded to me like in that instance, you were you were able to instantaneously recognize 
the thing to say that would protect you. Yeah, yeah. That you had analyzed the situation instantaneously. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Now, did you bring that kind of perception into your work when looking at, let's say, systemic uh, discrimination as a kind of uh, perception of kind of ability to look into structures and situations and to deconstruct them? I, I should say, you know, more than likely, yes. I, uh, I, I just think that... Uh, it was it became the way that for me to be able to exist in the world in a in a world that whether it was you know suburban westchester or the, the bronx to be able to survive it because i was like really so, not of either either environment you know i was just not i was just different and so it did help me to kind of understand where people were other people were and where their mindset was and what their interests were, what they didn't know and what they did know and and sort of use that to sort of navigate my life and keep me, as you say, safe. Um, so, yeah, and, and you, know, you just get asked a lot, a lot of, well, I'm sure there are others here who have been asked various questions for, for various reasons, but they, some people are obviously curious, other people are, are just trying to one up you, and you and so you sort of it it makes you very aware of people and their 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 needs, their wants, and their you know aspects of them that they don't know they're letting you know. Continue with that aspects of them they don't know what. Oh, I said uh, aspects of them that they they don't know that you are understanding about them essentially and, or what you're seeing they may, in not, them. they may not know their own programming too that's what i'm trying to say that i that uh yeah they don't realize that how how would i be able to know them in a certain way or how but it helped me navigate the environment you know i never really i never had any problems even you know in the south bronx uh but um it was all you know all you know, I I had bad. They couldn't understand me at all because of where uh, you know my family is from and where we were living and uh, had lived before. So I realized pretty early that uh, uh, I understood them more than they understood me. By the way, um, was there time at SUNY Purchase uh, in the seventies for you to incubate? some of the work that you were eventually doing? Was that something that, that was um, a, a formidable time for you? Well, I think that, you know, the, the freedom of the, in, of the environment and the, the newness of it, right. you know, the lack of, you know, rules for how this college is set up and what they expect of you and how, you know, everybody was new, the faculty, everything was new. So you really, it was really a great environment to kind of find, understand yourself, meet people that you'd never meet before, and uh, and grow from from our our mutual uh, not knowing. <laughs> was that was that an attractive element for you to to decide to go there? Well, you know, I get I certainly was. I think that's why you know Cooper would might not have been good for me because it, it was it was so in love with itself and uh also um they knew their position their status or what they felt they were and uh, <laughs> and so you know then you have to be measure up to that and uh and we didn't have that we it was all new so there's there was not these upperclassmen that all of us would put you down or whatever yeah uh and so we just we we you know it was a very free environment. Uh, we, we we were branding SUNY that's, Purchase. That's I mean, right, exactly. We didn't know it. We, <laughs> I, I went into I went into the basement to see it of the of the museum to see if what you had put on the mirrors were still there, but they're, they're not up there anymore. <laughs> I don't know if you ever. <laughs> Do you remember it's that? Just, it's just the first selfie ever made. <laughs> Do you remember what it said, friend? 
I don't remember what it said. What did it say? He said, this is a self-portrait. <laughs> yes, for selfish. Stencil letters, you know, one inch high. Yeah. Yes, I and, remember that And in part. the corner, in the corner, this is the killer. Please do not remove <laughs> property of SUNY purchase. <laughs> I, I hope that that was a contagious um, presence for you. That was great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Apparently. I still remember it, so. Yeah, that, that's, that's lovely. And um, we'll bring it back. I think we should bring it back. <laughs> but it was a sort of, you know, idea of a selfie. Mm -hmm. that people could be creative right there. Right. And be in that moment. Who am I now? Mm -hmm. Who am I? You could turn around and be somebody else. <laughs> um, right. But the idea of intervening with the system mm -hmm. was prominent in my mind. Mm. And the idea of, of power. Mm -hmm. Later on, I sent cigarette smoke back to cigarette factories with a thousand people. <laughs> so I was operating in this other space, like uh -huh. on the bridges, climbing on bridges. Yes, yes. To keep terrorism off the front page for a day. Mm. So I got used to that sort of mega structure that working in big public spaces and systems. Mm. Uh, deconstructing the nature of the system and using it to subvert its own sort of uh, corruption mm -hmm. in a way. So to take over the mass media with a positive intention. Mm -hmm. um, and and you, you, of course, accelerated in the space of working within the institution mm -hmm. and uh, as a sort of, um, you know, catalyst for change within Mm -hmm. within the, the, the situation and said so exhilarating for Fred. um and and um i mean it's it's just um i i get quite a feeling of you know ecstatic feeling to think about <laughs> your work and and of course the um the iconic mining the museum right right um but does does mining the museum come before or after your whitney performance as a as a museum guard uh, Do you remember? Yeah, I'm trying to remember if if it can. I think uh, the uh, mind the museum came. Yes, before the before the intervention of of me as a museum guard. And you you were a dancer at one time, Fred. Yeah, I, I danced. You know, with uh, I mean, I didn't professionally dance, but I took a lot of dance at, at purchase. And with uh, with Mel Wong, who was uh, just terrific. I'm so sorry he's 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 gone now, but yes, he was so terrific. Yeah, uh, and because uh, that was also very freeing for me. I just I was just curious about. I, I took uh, makeup for the stage with I forget the famous makeup artist who was teaching up there at that time. And oh yeah, it and, was, and lighting. Um, you know, there was a student. Name. Was his daughter was one of the one of the. Uh, acting students this guy yeah oh, right 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 yes yeah i think he did um al pacino in scarface or something like that too no kidding this guy yeah. i can't remember his name but um it, it was certainly a very um formidable creative atmosphere at suny purchase no question right um but i guess the question would be also yeah when you when you enter into the space of the museum, the historical society in in um, Baltimore, mm -hmm. Maryland. Um, did you see that as a as a performance art experience as well? Uh, in, in as much as anything I do is, I mean, I I I I, I realized early on that I and I may I think I may be repeating myself that I understand that I understood people that I met more than they understood me. And so, uh, or who I was or where I was from, or, or, or they, they, everyone had their own preconceived notions about because of their upbringing, their, 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 what the, what the state, what the country uh, thinks about uh, African-Americans. And so I was kind of ready for, all of it, and and once you sort of kind of understand those kind of uh, uh, 
what do you call uh if it's not prejudice it's it's uh just uh, misunder misunderstandings or just people's perceptions then <laughs> then you're in control you know and uh and so i i never had you know i was always one step ahead of their thinking and understanding perhaps their uh un, you know uncom much more uncomfortable than i was like with the historical society obviously historical society uh would make anybody uncomfortable but it's <laughs> like that one but uh <laughs> but i was quite aware of of you know of this alien coming into their their space museums in general i guess they've loosened up a little bit or at least they've loosened up around me but in general you know keep a wall around them so that nobody kind of uh uh kind of critiques or anybody who they don't respect uh they, there's this air of you know no who would critique what we are doing because we know what we're doing and so it's i think it's maybe it's just because i'm more involved more of a museum person now than i was you know back then but but uh it just seems that uh that it's a little less like that now but i maybe it's just because i'm sort of deeply involved with the institutions now and people know me so but uh but in that of course i i always felt that i was at an advantage coming in knowing more than they thought i knew or understanding more about who they are in the world than what who i than they understanding who i am so that i really understood where their discomfort came from uh so i just made i was just very relaxed and made them relax and then that's when all the the nuances and all the I became uh, able to hear and understand and and be told all the kind of gnarly stuff within the within the institution, and uh, and sort of get the confidence of many people and as I confided in them because I I needed them and they needed you know me to when I wanted to do my project I needed them to to lead me through what they knew so that I could pull out what I what I the questions I had from what they knew about the institution. Um, maybe maybe Emily wants to share some of these um, images so people have a sort of a oh yeah a yeah. grasp of what what Fred was doing. Right. Um, can you give us a short elevator pitch about? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that, that, obviously um, I put too much stuff in here, but okay, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, well, here we go. Here we go. All right. Oh yes, uh, and uh, this, this sculpture was an early. Tell sculpture. me to tell me to go forward, backward, whatever okay. you want. Okay, okay. I don't, where was this in the beginning or the or the middle? Beginning. The beginning. By, okay. By, by the I, way, Fred. Fred um, yes. When I saw this work the other day, I I immediately thought of um, Kiefer. Mm. Do you know this work of Kiefer mm -hmm. where he has a woman holding? like a ton of books over her head oh really and yeah i'll send you the image later yeah. on but um is uh well there you go but this is this must be after uh mining the museum uh i was it i don't remember you know this is the problem uh well uh, did you what? start making objects like this um you know early in your work or 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 later on um, let's see. I'll tell you that right now. I've sort of, I've sort of mixed everything up in my brain. So, mind the museum was in '91, right? Uh, well, that's when I first started doing the research at the museum. Okay. Uh, but uh, then the um, the rest of it came, I guess. Yeah, I think it, most everything came after it because I. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so I mean, it kind it, of it kind of made sense after I started. But you see, the thing is, what's makes it difficult because I worked at the Met and I worked at the Museum of Natural History and at MoMA briefly. So all this stuff was was going around in my head. It's just when I actually made the sculpture, I'm not really. I have to look through my my uh, CV, but yeah. it's it you know. So it, pretty much these things are rolling around in my head and then just putting them in form in a form. Uh, came either after or lo longer to kind of pull out what I, what I'm thinking, or just let it come out, and um, just from being in museums and kind of understanding their perspectives on their stuff. 
Um, yeah, and so that that's Jansen's was my Jansen's from art history classes. Very glad to give it away to or to actually sell it <laughs> in this form. But so, uh, yeah, mining the museum. What what happened? In you know what 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 was it that caused such a radical um, change of perspective from from within? What did right. you do there? Right. Is this uh, the first picture? This from is that? this this is the first. Yeah, this is from mining the museum. This actually is the museum uh, space that I that was there when I got there. Oh. Uh, yeah. This is how the display. And um, and there's there's you know I I kind of dove in to sort of understand. Uh, they had thought about museum display in a long time, so this is I just wanted to kind of deconstruct some of these images because the the you know institutions or a lot of curators at that time certainly there would kind of use use their knowledge of a particular field as as their shield and uh, and and if you sort of Look at it from a different direction; they totally don't know what to do. I mean, no, sometimes no, they you know. Go, you go behind the shield. What happens I, behind the shield? Yes, and uh, so uh, and because they're looking at it for particular reasons, I'm looking for something else that seems to be glaringly obvious. And so, uh, so let's, they let's can, look at that. Look at that painting in the back. This that, painting uh, was in my project. Yeah, and the lower right hand corner. Who well, is that? yeah. Let, Later on, you'll see very, very clearly. I mean, there's a couple of other other images down the way. The the uh, I moved that painting to another environment to sort of pull it out of out of where it was, where it would would not allow you to kind of, unless you're someone like me, looking looking for things like this. But you would totally not see those two boys, on the, one on the floor, one in the in the in the doorway, because you were not supposed to see them, and and they were very good at making you see. Museum is very good at making you see what they want you to see and not think about anything else. And so, uh, money, money, power. Yeah, I, well, the historical side. Well, it was more power for these individuals because there was no money in the historical side, which is another thing that uh, was a big facade. That mm -hmm. that they were, you know, the patricians of Maryland, or or of the of. Uh, of yeah of maryland uh were in the board but also the curators uh ma made you think you knew they knew everything there was to know and there was nothing else to know but they they uh they just rallied their the uh the wagons in a circle and then just talked at this their same language and as if there's nothing else to know and and for for us who who were studied art rather than studied the scholarship of these things, uh, seeing is is above anything else, and so so I kind of had something that they didn't have, which was being able to see other things within these instant within these uh, artworks that was not their interest, so they didn't see it, and so in my exhibition, all I did was make make everyone see it. And then it's sort of reflected back on the institution. Once you can't unsee it. Well, let's see. There are more examples from that show. Yeah, yeah. yeah this was the first thing you saw off the elevator uh, or the stairway. Was this globe? And the globe uh, was in the storage. I sort of went in storage and brought things out that they never would show. And this, it says it's a globe that says truth across it, and it was a globe made it for. Truth and advertising in the I don't know the uh, the 30s or 40s, but it was the first thing you saw as you as you went into my exhibition. Uh, so it just took on another another uh, meaning, and so it was surrounded by these these uh, busts. What you have here is this is Henry Clay, and let's see all the way on the other side there. How do I get this? You know, can you see this guy up over here? Yes. Uh, on the left side? On on the right side. Yeah, this guy here. Uh, that was Andrew Jackson. And this guy in the center is Napoleon. And so while this is 
not uh, an international collection. Uh, they had a portrait of Napoleon there. I guess I think his some niece lived in Baltimore at some one point. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I wanted to put them all out there because they really didn't have much to do with the historical society of Baltimore. And then on the on the other side were these three empty pedestals, uh, except they had labels. Uh, Benjamin Banneker. Um, oh gosh, uh, Frederick Douglass and yeah. Harriet Tubman, right? And all of them from Baltimore. Nothing about them in the historical society. So, mm -hmm. so you know, once I started pulling these things out, people began to get a sense of what I was doing. And then some some of the curators started finding things that I didn't know was in storage. And so we, it was not that they, you know. They wanted to be helpful, and they did. They were, uh, uh, just as long as I. It was very clear that this was my project, not their project. So their scholarship was not affected by whatever I did. So, yeah. yeah. And there's that painting again. This is the one next to next to that painting uh, on the edge of the wall uh, had a rip in it. I asked for a painting that had a rip in it. And because every museum has a painting with a rip in it, they just don't talk about it. Uh, so, and I looked at various paintings and said, oh, this is the one I want. And there was, the rip was right across this patrician's face, uh, you know, hanging down. And and so I made a video uh, of uh, a black man's, a black man behind this, it's light because it's a, a video, but it was a black man looking through, you know, one eye was the black guy, the other eye was the the white guy. And uh, I had a, a voice come on and say, nobody knows I'm inside of you except mama. Mm -hmm. And uh, on from there. So basically talking about, thinking about uh, people passing for white and very light-skinned people. And... Uh, and that became a, a real conversation because it was a video behind this painting. And, you know, they had to, they really had to, to talk about it to the public, what this idea was. Now, I don't know this man had African roots or anything, but it was just to sort of bring that to the fore because, of, you know, this other painting that uh, John was talking about right next to it was very, well, just, just show the next slide. It was a very dark painting. Uh, but I added lights on there. This is a family of people and uh, a family of uh, from Baltimore. And then in the periphery, you had these two black children, and uh, they also had voices coming from the from them, like who you know where's uh, where's my mother? You know who calms me when I'm afraid? Who washes my back? Things like that, and. Uh, mm -hmm. Where were the um, martyrs and speakers in the room? Behind, behind the painting. Behind the painting. So yes, you heard, you heard voices, but not um, there were no faces. Uh, just the faces in the painting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, yeah. And so it was, you know, it's quite wow. clear what this was. Yeah. Uh, and they only, they only, the voice only came on when you step in, step in front of the painting. The light only came on when you step in front of the painting. So, and the, the thing is, they had the names of those children. They just weren't listed on the on the uh, label. Uh, yeah. And uh, they were, you know, part of that household, and the the the, the owner of the household, including them, uh, were, uh, you know, sent them to. Uh, local school and uh, the school declined to have them but uh there are you know so there's a lot of stories behind a lot of these these images that you know i didn't go into detail i was just trying because my i was sort of hoping for a meta picture of things that you think you know but you don't really really know you're not looking at you're not looking not thinking about you're thinking about and looking at what the museum wants you to think about and not the totality of the story yeah, I mean, from from your from your point of view and your sensibility, what most people think of as juxtaposition 
are just sort of reality, how how it is. Mm-hmm, right. It's not necessarily juxtaposed. It's simply how it is. Yes, yes. There's, there's not true. a du- duality about it. It's right. what it is. Mm-hmm. And what is it? And that's, you're giving us this um, point of view, this new mm-hmm. way of looking. Uh, so Emily had a question um, about that. Um, you want to ask the question, Emma, or should I? I I think is now the right time for that question because maybe the juxtaposition. Okay, you can ask it. So Emily Emily was was saying uh, creating a practice of juxtaposition seems to imply a feeling of temporary interdependence. Mm-hmm. Did this feeling come through in mining the museum, or did? the juxtaposition of elements seem like new singular artworks? Uh, well, I mean, I like the idea that that this painting is is a new artwork, you know, just changing its, you know, that that uh, reveal, the reveal is changing the meaning so much that it becomes a new, a new thought, a new painting. Uh, you know, for the dyed in the wool kind of historic painting folks, uh, they I, they they would have to see it, but they, could they turn it off? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, yeah, you can't unsee but, it. Yes, and certainly for the public, it was you know obviously very clear. You're, you're giving it a new life. You're giving the painting a new a new painting, a new a new dimension. Right. Um, Emily, how do you feel about that? Any follow up on that? No. Yeah. This is this 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 painting is a similar situation. This, I moved this painting, and the director said, "You know, I've, I looked at that painting. I, I come it was right next to the front door. I looked at that painting every day. I never saw that black child there." <laughs> so that's an extreme, but you know, it's it's a reality for for when you when you want to see something, you see it. If you if you're if it's not part of your world or your view or your interests, it just disappears. I mean, this this director was pretty radical in that yes. he wanted to be part of what you guys were doing with, with Micah. Right. Um, and with the No Museum project. Right, right. So he's quite uh, someone to, you know, really admire. And eventually the poor guy lost his job. Right, exactly, exactly. And it's because no one, none of the other museums, but he felt that none of the other museums came to his aid, came to support him. He had only, I didn't realize, but he had only been there a couple of years. Uh, so, uh, but uh, so that said a lot about Baltimore in, in general, the museum culture there. Yeah. Um, um, I see that we don't have a whole heck of a lot of time left over. Of course. Uh, just, That's how it yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, well, we can just go quickly through this. This one says "Country Life" by Ernest Fisher, eighteen fifty something. And look, the next image, same painting, but I titled it was it's called "Country Life," but I titled it "Frederick du- Frederick Serving Fruit" because it could have been Frederick Douglass doing that. <laughs> uh, so uh, wow. again, just labels can really shift your your viewpoint. Your what you see and what you think about. Thank you. So that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And of course this one, which has got a lot of images, but again, I, I, I did find, uh, you have to in... tell people what they're looking at. Okay. Well, it's, it's, it's really, they're, they're very proud of the Reposé silver tea service and, and all the Reposé silver that they had. And I worked with a silver uh, curator, and then I looked in the ledger books and found these slave shackles. And and the museum was also one of those places that were about the material of things, you know, not a whole lot about where it was from or anything about it other than it was kind of the, the fineness of the material. So, you know, these shackles are made of metal. So that's kind of how I, how I spoke about everything uh in the in the exhibition but then you couldn't ignore the other aspects that were quite different 
<laughs> oh, yeah, that's a close up. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the curators, sometimes they knew what they had. But since this woman in silver had nothing to do with that, uh, she was the first time she saw it. But there were other things that were in in that collection that, you know. Is the whipping were... post in this series, Fred? Yes, yes. Oh, and this actually, uh, this was from a, the next project I did uh, in uh, Old Salem, in Winston-Salem, and where they apparently, it's a, like a, like a Williamsburg kind of environment. You walk around and go into buildings and things like that. Uh, and uh, there is no, there is nothing, you know, what George Washington slept in the tavern. It was, you know, it's like one of those old spaces. And this one, uh, I, and there were obviously Africans working. They didn't live in the, in that air, in the, the center of the community because they were a very religious uh, group and uh but it, i put together these two things one is a leather bible and the other is a leather slave whip uh, under leather bound was the label mm -hmm. uh, because you, you there was nothing about the the africans there you could you couldn't find them but there was they were there it wasn't a huge population compared to the they were moravians so they didn't really deal with the outside world too much but they had their africans they're Africans. <laughs> Fred, do you, do, you uh, remember, do you remember the book um, Cast? Which one? Cast. Cast. Yeah. No. Oh, out. Cast. Oh, Cast. Yeah, right, right, right. right? <laughs> yes, this and, new, the and new, the fact this. that these Nazi lawyers got together and based the annihilation of the Jews basically on the, the Jim Crow laws in the United mm. States. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so pervasive across the yes. entire earth yes yes as you have uh right. later contextualized as well in your work yeah yeah crazy anyway that was oh and they yeah. I, I was looking for a place to put some artwork uh because it was a historic house village and they had all the they were being used as historic houses for people to uh, come and visit and so I wanted another space and they, there was this building that was, didn't seem like anything was being done with it. And I asked them, could I do something with this building? They said, sure, it's the, it's, it was the black church and we just use it for storage. So since they weren't using it, I thought I'd do a little something with it. Uh, so you can go to the next image. I put these silhouettes, I had a silhouette artist who was there make silhouettes of the local black community. And I put them all up on across the grass because there, instead of there were no stones for the black the folks who are in the ground. So I just, you know, made stand-ins as these silhouettes. And that's when you would go into the, into the, into the building. This is, yeah, I said it was in North Carolina. You go into the building and the next slide is. Mm -hmm. You know, there were no stones anywhere and they couldn't find the stones. They didn't know where they were. There was nothing in the in the uh in the storage. They didn't see there because there were burials in front of there uh, in front of this black church. Well, I I had them lift the floorboards and there they were. So just what? thrown on just thrown what? under the under the church. Then nobody there knew how they got there. What what, well, what? what what made you want to lift the floorboards, Fred? I just because I had looked behind the church, I looked around the church, I went to all the different buildings. Uh, and then what I found out was there was a Sunday school built on the front of the church for for kids. And uh, so that there were two different, there was the older building and then the newer building. And of course, being a historic village, they stopped their history lesson basically at the older building. So this new part had been built, but it was beyond their subject. So <laughs> it was just there. It was it was attached to, to the major church. And I said, well, can I do something in there? And they said, yes. And I said, well, uh, can we? Can I uh, lift the floorboards to see what's underneath the church? And I wasn't, I didn't mean that as looking for the stones. I just wanted to see what they were covering. If it was burial plots there. 
uh, and then they, I saw it this way, mm -hmm. and uh, it was there. Everyone was completely shocked. Timothy, a native of Africa, top one says, uh, and then the, his year, and he said he played the violin. And this one, you know, they all had their uh, bits of information about the people who were the Black Moravians who were there. And nobody knows how long they were sitting there like that or how they got there or maybe when the Sunday school was built over it. But still, it was just a, an enigma. Uh, and so I lit I lit that space like this so you could actually see what was under there. And I had their memorials because everybody, all the Moravians had memorials. And so did the Africans who were there too, some who became Moravian and some were who were worked. Uh, but that's, uh, and still to this day, I have no idea. They built another little building for the stones, but really they're not paying attention to it. <laughs> you know, if they, right the, at the- These yeah. stones required a lot of labor to produce. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. so what um, What was the sort of financial power behind that labor? Who who commissioned these things? How did they do that? It's all it's all a mystery. I, I you know, it was obviously a white pastor in the, for this black church back then. So uh, you know when they first when they were carved and when the person people passed away. So and when it was actually a cemetery uh, for them, but I when it when it kind of went into disrepair. I don't know when the uh, you know when all this occurred, and nobody does. Uh, at least nobody's talking. Um, yeah. Wow. And this is happening all over the world. Yeah, exactly. Fred, exactly. We're looking at the Venice Biennale. Right. Um, around the beginning of this present century, two thousand four, maybe. Uh, uh, yeah, um, three, three. Ago. Yes, you're close. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, uh, you went to Italy for about a year. Yes. Uh, immersed yourself in this Venetian culture. Um, you produced this pretty innovative work, which included a performance artist. Um, well, you can tell us a little bit more, but ultimately the Americans didn't find this to be very American art. Right, the, right. The, which is quite, quite a success. Yeah, um, exactly. You totally. immersed yourself in the, the immediate culture. Mm -hmm. You absorbed that culture and you transmuted it into this uh, uh, other experience. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, I had a project in Venice, Italy that was intended to do the same kind of immersive uh -huh. experience for artists who would travel around the world bringing um, aspects of new cult of old culture into the, uh, new, the new one circulating. I called it yeah. the intravenous museums. Oh, wow. And I had my first base in Venice mm -hmm. across from the island of the Biennale. Uh -huh. um, and Andy Warhol and boys supported that project. Uh, oh, fantastic. Other artists. So it's interesting that we... Yeah. We has been yeah, ships basement. passing in the night. Yes, yes. But, but tell us about what you did at the Venice Biennale, friend. Well, you know, I was interested in the Africans of Venice and that uh, from past centuries or contemporary times, and uh, and you can see them in various paintings, Carpaccio, um, you know, Veronese, you know, so many, some of them. They're they're the, these characters in the paintings, and I was you know. You never hear anything about them and how they got there and why they were there. I mean, there was no in those early centuries. There was not a, like a, a slavery, uh, but but obviously there were wars and 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 um, you know mercenaries and all sorts of reasons that people would come would become and of course the Venetians would come up and with their their uh, retinue, which would be, would be Africans as well, um, and so. Uh, but I was fascinated with the, with what what the invisibility of all that to 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 not to Venetians, but except that you know it was just part of the scene and wasn't wasn't thought about much. But like these two figures that you see on on the on, on the Statue Uniti di America um, are these are scrims of 
of the actual sculptures which are in the Ferrari Church in 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 uh, in Venice, and they're they're about that size, uh, and there are four of them. I only put the scrims of two, and um, because because of the kind of uh, you know crazy kind of relationship with it being Statue Unita di America and these enslaved characters, oh, and but we were in Venice, and they're you know. Oh, <laughs> So wow. it was quite American, actually, Fred. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. People, you know, just that was funny. They thought it was very American. And I said, well, no, <laughs> I didn't ah. get these images in Venice. I mean, in, in the States, these are Venetians. And the Venetians all knew about, knew all this, the history of the, not the history, but the historians knew, Venetian historians knew about these characters and others that are in Carpaccio paintings and Veronese paintings and, you know, uh, and uh, so I just wanted to sort of bring them out of the shadows because they're as, as Venetian as in the history as any, as anything else. And uh, so that, so throughout you had things like that um, and, and additional combinations of, of of things that I found those I don't think this I don't think I have it in here the the image oh there it is there's one you know in all these uh these hotels they have these 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 boys holding holding this you know a, a pillow and I don't know if they had sometimes they had the, the hotels cards on them or whatever I don't know what they're originally for but anyway they were they were representing the the uh, these boys that obviously lived and worked in in Venice in years and years past, but it, the image is very considered very Venetian. Um, but, you know, obviously I put the, the globe on, on, on his head because it's called the wanderer because, you know, they're all over the world. Um, all, and you see them, these, not with that, with my head, but with the, with, uh, with the globe and stuff, um, you see them in front of hotels. If you've not been to Venice, it's there, these characters, stand in front of hotels or in their lobbies and uh as a part of the venetian scene uh and Fred, I just, yeah. when i was living in venice for three years one of my very good friends who was actually a, a, a gallery owner mm -hmm. told me anything south of bologna is africa <laughs> wow interesting that was the attitude within italy Wow, wow, wow. Oh, for the South yeah, about the Southerners, yes, yes, for sure. For sure. That would be my family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about that. Oh, oh, and then uh Oh wow. This is this is the first uh chandelier I, I did, this huge chandelier, because you know, the Venetian have these incredibly white and pastel color chandeliers, and uh I wanted to do a black chandelier. The first thing that I thought of paint this the uh, the cupola in in the pavilion, this color that you'd see in San Marco, uh, at the Saint Mark's Church and um, the basilica, and uh, and then have a large chandelier. And that's that's Venetian glass. Oh yes, I mean when I first asked the guy, I said, "Hey, I want to I want a chandelier." He's, oh, no problem. Whatever. What do you want? I said, "I want a black chandelier." He goes, "Black? Well, I can do that. Whatever you want." And. You know, and uh, and it was huge. And uh, he said, "He said, well, I, you know, I, I made sculpture for, for Yoko Ono, so I can do anything." So anyway, so, <laughs> so that was the first one. And it, the the project was called "Speak of Me as I Am," which is a a line from Othello, who was the most famous Black Venetian that never lived. But uh, and uh, so that's kind of how the project started. Uh, and there are different aspects. Sort of bringing that into the fold, uh, in in into this building, so that I mean, hopefully, if you walk around Venice, there it would you would sort of see the, another layer of the of the history that is untold and but very there. Oh man! In in Germany, they used to have a candy. In my time, when I was living mm. in, in Europe, they would have a, a candy called the Moorkopf. Mm -hmm. which are the black heads. Oh, right. And these, these little chocolate heads in a box. Mm -hmm. Or more coffin. I mean. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that stuff has disappeared finally. 
it's, I'm not sure the Morkov has disappeared. You know, it's very true because where did I, I was in Germany, but they had these uh, tea cups with with little black children on the on the cups. <laughs> I don't know what, what that was about, but anyway. Uh, so, anyway, so I, I started doing more of these projects and 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 thinking about Othello, and that's kind of uh, what this one is. This is I forget what the name of this one what, is. What but... was your basic relationship with Othello and your commentary about it? A little, little bit <laughs> nutshell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just felt very, you know, because of the Venice experience, but also he Othello being the only major character in a, in a Shakespearean play that was was black and was about about him and about this, what happened in that environment. And, you know, uh, so I, I, I kind of, I really like Shakespeare and I like that particular play. And so I, I like twisting a, twisting it around and thinking about aspects of it in making, making it work. This is uh, To Die Upon a Kiss. That's the name of this one. Um, and so I just, um, Oh, I mean, and his writing is so amazing that I just use a lot of his t titles. This, for me, this one particular one uh, is like, as the title co goes, "To Die Upon a Kiss," which is what he, when he killed himself. Uh, the 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 kind of the life force of Othello kind of leaking out of the body, going down, and maybe his soul going up or whatever. I don't know what th that might be, but. Uh, so that's kind of how I how I think about these these works. I kind of try to work on on one, and and or some, sometimes the uh, uh, the image of the of the ex of the project spurs me on to think about what this would look like. This actually, I made this. My father was dying, and uh, I came to realize as I was making the work and. Uh, coming back and forth between, he lived in Spain, coming back and forth between Spain and and, and Venice. Uh, this piece really kind of had that, had beyond, went beyond what I was thinking about between the Venetians and Othello. That's the in it, but it's also about, you know, the life force of my father kind of just, you know, leaking, going, you know, emptying out of the body. Uh, not Not everyone knows that your father was an author. That's right. He was he was an engineer. Mm -hmm. He traveled the world. He was a student of Krishnamurti, mm -hmm. the um, presumed um, um, last Buddha of this ep epoch. Krishnamurti was supposed to be mm -hmm. yes, yes, this reincarnated Buddha. He renounced that position in position, yeah, and became quite an amazing spiritual teacher about a hundred years ago. Um, and your dad was highly influenced by Krishnamurti and wrote a beautiful book. What is it called, Emily? Mind is Mind. Time. Mind is Time, time. Fred's mm -hmm. father's right. book, which I hope mm -hmm. we can um, explore more in our radio tuning fork one of these days, yes. one of these weeks. Fred, it, it's like you've made um, objects uh, having come out of the institutional space you started making objects mm -hmm. that became <laughs> art uh, collection items. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And it seems as though you're sort of inside inside the system, uh, integrating new values, new mm -hmm. aesthetics, new language into the um, sort of industry of, of the art, art world. Um, right. Did you see it that way when you were doing this? Were you conscious that, oh, now I'm going to produce objects that will uh, disrupt the way the um, industry works? Uh, you know, no, I don't think I, you know, I was thinking along those lines. I just was, you know, pushing in the directions that, you know, inspired me, that made me want to make work and made me want to, and hopefully it's true, uh, what is true is that you know seeing it something in a different form or or a different color uh, makes you know shakes it up a bit and 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 that was being in Venice was it was was a great kind of space to ha have that happen because of course the Venetians know their culture is, uh, 
And uh, so this was something interesting for them. So it was interesting for them. I, you know, <laughs> I thought, well, maybe it's also interesting for other people. But uh, and of course, they didn't take you know they didn't take offense or anything. They didn't you know it wasn't like that. The Venetians were very curious about what I was doing. And uh, did you have dialogue with Venetian artists, Fred? Uh, you know, I did not meet that many. I met you. Know, interestingly, at the opening, one guy came over to me uh, who was an artist. Say he was an artist. And said that you know he he his family uh, had been Moors, but he looked like every other Venetian. So it was a long time ago when the, and the, and then he I, I wanted to talk to him more, and he disappeared in the in the crowd of the opening <laughs> of the Versace. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. wait a minute, I want to talk to. You. Uh, but anyway, I, I wish he would just sort of appear, but because he sounded really interesting. But well, so yeah, it was a great place to tr try out these ideas. Out because the Venetians were very curious and open to it. Now, now Venice is a place where there are no motor vehicles other than water uh, vehicles, right. boats, little boats, little vaporetto, and little things. Like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, did you find that it was um, conducive to going in to your mind in a, in a contemplative way, in a sustained way of immersing yourself in that in that culture, in that mentality? Completely, because, you know, without cars, you know, things slow down, although sometimes I had to rush through, rush from one <laughs> place to another. But, but you know, but really, it's a different mo modality, you know, uh, and, uh, and you're surrounded by all this incredible, you know, things and beauty. And, uh, yeah, it really does help the creative mind, I think. To, to sort of be there and try to come up with something. Once I came on my on my path, it was great to kind of be able to sort of draw out as much as I could in that environment. So it was very, very inspiring. Um, these mirrors are also a project, process, uh, uh, these sort of piling of mirrors are also similarly uh, of, with of black glass. But, um, and if they were so open and to something new, which was also very helpful. <laughs> You know, they were not critical or why are you doing that about us? You know, no no defensiveness at all. They were just enjoyed seeing what came out of it. And of course, I'm interested in beauty. So, and obviously they live in a beautiful place. They're, you know, they think about it. Uh, maybe they don't, it's so, so surrounded by it. They don't know. They don't know to talk about it. But, it, you know, for me, it was just a really great, I enjoy going back to, to make more and other this kind of stuff. Uh, you know. We'd love to talk with you more about your. Um, oh yeah, these are black tears. Yeah, my my drips, tears. Uh, could be ink, could be oil, could be you know whatever you kind of imagine it to be. But it's it's very fertile. Again, a fertile form for me that I keep coming back to. Um, just to jump ahead for a sec i know yeah, that sure. you have a public work uh at laguardia airport oh yeah i don't think i put anything in oh, too bad. it's not anyway. there yeah um but if you could tell us just uh, briefly about what is the intervention or installation at laguardia yeah I'm so sorry and i didn't put one in rather, there rather recent but, friend, rather, yes, rather new yes uh, like a year or two ago amazing it's now it's been already a year or two uh it's uh you know it's it's an a three-story atrium uh and uh it's kind of a globes cascading large globes the largest one is 11 feet in diameter and and then go down from that size but they're they're painted globes and then also some of these drips coming in between uh falling in between the globes <laughs> and this one is another and so um, unlike this, it, it, these globes are huge and they're painted by myself, by myself and also my studio, uh, manager and, and, and some of these, uh, Germans who came, came and actually some of them were some, you know, they were from other countries too. It was a Russian, a Slovenian, you know, who were in, who were in Stedhagen, uh, when I was there working at this place. And so, so how, how many globes approximately? Oh, how many globes were there? I mean, we're talking 20. There are 10, 10, 10 or 11, something like that. At LaGuardia. 
at LaGuardia. And Where? you can see them for every floor. Uh, if you walk into LaGuardia and you go to the right, at the, and you can't quite miss them you know, on, on any floor, but they're in the atrium and you can sort of, sort of see them. Uh, would, would you say they're a, a meter in diameter? Uh, one is, a, the largest one is 11 feet, I think. What? Yeah, in diameter, yeah, the largest one. And then it goes <laughs> down to, feet? yes, yes. It took a lot longer to yeah. finish that project than <laughs> expected. <laughs> you had to paint them with rollers, man. Yeah, right, you'd think. But yeah. no, we were all out there. Well, not, I mean, Jen was out over there doing her darndest to get this damn thing done. Uh, and then, so, as I said, these uh, other folks from from the local environment. And it was... Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was great. You, you you did more thing. Have you done more things, let's say, in the world, uh, in the outer exterior world, uh, over the years? You you integrated more work publicly and. Not really. I haven't had that kind of opportunity. So I um, I would uh, you know, love to do something in other other countries. Uh, and usually I'm invited. I've done things in us. You know the museum interventions in Australia and one is coming up in, in Italy and, uh, and in Paris and, um, uh, you know, I've done them different, different cities, but nothing, you know, individual artworks usually with museums invite me to do a project with their collection. Um, let's see. That last globe that I showed with, uh, the uh, chandelier, the little chandelier parts on the globe uh, was uh, what did I call that? That one was very special. Oh my god, I can't even remember. Anyway, the last work I think that we um, saw lately uh, is it in Columbus Park or something in Brooklyn? Oh yes, 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 uh, yes. and I that one. That was a another really important one for me. It came down, and now it's in storage, way out in the middle of I don't know where, where wherever we're, pay stores. We're going to steal it, Fred. <laughs> yeah, okay. we're, we're bringing it upstate. Okay, I'll let them know. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, yeah. I don't have a picture of it. It's funny I did bring that, but yeah, it was um, another kind of project that I. That it was nice to do because it was kind of totally out of my realm. Uh, it was, I was, and I just could mention that that project was made of uh, metal, uh, and uh, and it was it, it was composed of figures inside of these these uh, environments, which which you know some people call them cages. I don't particularly care to call them that. Uh, but in order to keep them safe from from overnight, there were these in kind of uh, beautiful uh, metal enclosures for for them, uh, and um, it kind of came again partially from my my father. I wish I had a picture of it. This is kind of crazy just to talk about it. That's okay. But my my father was interested in you know. You know, con issues of consciousness, uh, but also, oh gosh, now I can't remember his name. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, well, yeah, William Blake. Okay. William Blake was uh, a, a, another someone who he, he liked. He was really interested in in, in his writing, and uh, so the project is kind of also influenced a lot by my father, as well as just uh, notions of, of uh, enclosure, notions of ideas of, of uh, how the environment affects affects who you are and how you think. But it, without saying it, it's kind of hard to kind of de describe it. But uh, And it was a very, the largest thing I've done besides- What, what was it called, Fred? It was called, Jen, I'm, I'm blanking now. What did, What was it called? The the thing in the park there, uh. Columbus Park. Oh. Right? Yeah, mine forged manacles, manacle forged mines. 
Yeah, well, your dad also used mind in his book title. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, uh, that I is have, partially I a... Right, uh, I have it right here, Fred. Oh. Uh, I'm going to screen share this, Emily. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, screen share. And there it is. Okay. Can we see that? There it is, yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's right outside the courthouse there where people would go and uh, and they had holding cells right near it. And on this also far up on the hill there, you see it's a it's a man on a pedestal who had been an abolitionist. Back here. Uh, yeah. Back. And he, yes. Uh, and uh, with these two black children climbing up to get to him. And and in on the foreground in front of the the courthouses it was Columbus, so it's it's there's it was a place with lots of other various meanings. And I've been interested in in decorative metal uh, uh, because I'm interested in beauty, but also in it what it uh, obfuscates perhaps ugliness or just the way one might think about it. And that's um, and so that's what this is about. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Blake's Mind Forged Manacles is from one of his his uh, books also, Manacle Forged Minds, which is exactly, and I sort of flipped that, Manacles Forged Minds. Fred, the figures, what are they mm -hmm. from or? Uh... They're, they are uh, from, I was in Senegal and uh, uh, started a project and COVID happened, but I had these these figures like that sent back to the states they were they the smallest one is is probably uh uh larger than the ones i than these uh, uh these figures uh and so i blew them up so that they would be sort of more closer to human size but also just uh they're they're cats of the cats of the of the wooden ones that i that i then blew them up to make them little, make them larger, and uh, you know, uh, you know, it's it was kind of what I wanted to kind of think about. There I am. Look at that. There I am <laughs> painting these, these, and these are the small ones. The big ones I left to the to uh, Jen and <laughs> and I forget what the boy's name was. What the what was name? So Esteban. What, yeah. These these are um, representing the natural resources on these continents. And you've deleted the political uh, sovereignty, you know, continents, um, names, and mm -hmm. and yeah. countries from it. Yeah, I just uh, just wanted to represent the the environments, not not have heavy laden political uh, thoughts. I see. I'm looking for a okay. Yeah, I guess that. That's my claim to name there. That one, that one image. Well, we've got to we've got to get more on the record about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Perhaps yeah. if if people are comfortable and Fred, you're comfortable going maybe five or ten minutes over. Oh, I'm fine. Whatever you want. Um, perhaps we can allow people to. Um, to ask Fred questions or to interact with Fred. Uh, let's see. Come back to the gallery view there. So uh, it, uh, that may come have come as a sudden uh, surprise to people that they can talk with Fred, but in the meantime, Fred, I wanted to ask you, Emily and I, uh, from the perspective of Institute for Cultural Activism and what we're trying to do uh, regionally and internationally, mm -hmm. um, question here is when, when relating to the hierarchy of the art industry, mm -hmm. is there a realistic chance for artists to actually shift the industrial paradigm to transform the value criteria of the art market, its historians, criticism, and legacy to be genuinely inclusive. 
Is there a chance that we can intervene in some way? Genuinely inclusive. Well, I think it's uh, it's only as genuine as the people who are doing it. And I, th but I, I think there's certainly opportunities for that um, in many different spheres. Well, you remember um, CoLab and the yes. Times Square show, yes, and other, perhaps other in, in, intentional art, you know, intervention communities. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we're we're trying to explore and introduce um, artists around the world to each other and to mm -hmm. methodologies that could be helpful in mm -hmm. helping us in these dark you know, ap oh, yes. apocalyptic times. Yes. And um, you're, perhaps you're, one of the gifts, one of the many <laughs> gifts you've given us is this method of deconstructing mm. and reinventing systems, mm -hmm. giving them a new dimension, a new purpose mm -hmm. by shifting um, the value system right. of, of a structure or a system and uh, we very much employ that with what we do. And Emily, for example, has her her uh, exoskeletal um, work called Contemplative Outerwear, oh. which is like a, a, a baseball cap with mm -hmm. all this um, silky fringe hanging in front of your face, so that when wow. you move, when you breathe, when you speak, when you move, you you have this expression of an ex exoskeleton. Huh of uh, power and impact in the environment. Wow. wow. Um, and, you know, we I mentioned uh, sending cigarettes from, back to cigarette factories. Oh, yes. We've worked with over 41 artists around the world. And I think that this deconstruction, um, analytic and rebuilding mm -hmm. of a new structure as, as art mm -hmm. that has a, a traumatic effect, a, a sort of breathtaking or suspending the normal mundane mind thinking mm -hmm. that we, we call a sublime trauma, mm -hmm. that that art object acts as a kind of placeholder mm -hmm. for people to think, to feel their bodies, to re-examine re mm -hmm. how the appearance of society uh, happens the way it happens to appear mm -hmm. and how we can maybe work with that as a raw mm -hmm. material, change it. Mm -hmm. So your work is very much inspiring on that on that level and other levels. And we just wonder, you know, uh, do you see that method of yours as being perhaps um, learnable and applicable, not only in art, but in, in everyday life, as you had your first encounter with that guy that <laughs> thought you were uh, Sonny Liston's son? <laughs> yeah. Can we learn that? What a joke! Yeah. Can we learn that? Ah, that's interesting. Uh, I, I, um, that's curious. I think it. I think it. It's just about awareness, like so many other uh, kind of, uh, you know, certainly in Eastern philosophy, awareness is is kind of a, a major thread and I just uh, so I I'm not the one to kind of know how that works but it's just it, it's uh, I do think that that's possible uh, have you seen especially... that you've seen that sort of um deployed or enabled through Eastern um, philosophy and practices is that what you're saying well yeah that's I mean to the degree that I've been around it, uh, because my father and his, he has had a meditation camp in upstate New York uh, when he was or was in living in the states. Uh, yeah, I think it 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 really does, you know, shift our modality there and our and our bodies. Uh, you know, uh, it's um, I think it's a again, a kind of a holistic thing that you just can't compartmentalize. Now, now I'm going to do my, uh, do my, uh, uh, you know, investigative 
work or my kind of, uh, I'm becoming this other person now. It sort of has to sort of come together uh, with, with all these other techniques that have been around for a long time. I'm just, I don't know, I just, I don't know much about how to sort of, uh, besides making work, how to kind of connect with people to kind of try to uh, uh, be, sort of embody that. But I, but yeah, I think it's certainly is possible. And I'm, I'm sure you and your, uh, and your work kind of does that too. And it sort of makes people aware. Awareness is a whole other thing that's that's important. Becoming aware of everything, of what's what your environment is, and and how how we how we ourselves play into it, or don't. And, and, and I think also that being cognizant of that awareness. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Watching how that awareness can shift and change and right. expand. Um, from looking at it from yes. another, yet another awareness. Yes, yes, it's true. Uh, and that, you know, we we aim to make work that, and to support work and uh -huh. uh, turn people on to work that, that helps us do that. Mm -hmm. So we're so, Emily, speaking on both of our behalfs, I think we're very indebted to you for oh. uh, being so generous with your, your time and your your soul here with us. Oh, well, um, it's been great. I think uh, at some point it looked, it seemed as though you, you really inhabited uh, an African, an African American point of view, mm -hmm. and occupied that position as an advocate and a transformer. Um, did you see having that agency uh, and the creative opportunities? And resources that that implied, did you see that at, at a certain point? Well, like, I'm, I have this access to the agency through my work, through my success, through hmm. association with a, um, you know, uh, an important prominent gallery. Mm -hmm. uh, that that you are actually enabled to empower. I would like to think in a so. Community. Yeah, well, I would like to think so. Um, you know, sometimes you can you do it through kind of what I'm, what you speak about it, but hopefully through the work, which is, has a farther reach than I can speak to. It it it's um, you know, it, everybody will do it in their own way, obviously, but it's it. I think it, the the work and or myself is kind of open enough to sort of allow people's various people's ideas and understandings and uh you know and do it their own way but if it's if what i do is helpful in sort of uh being more expansive and in their in people in their thinking that's fantastic and uh i mean i've i got that through both of my parents but in very very different ways my mother was the this was the creative visual art person, and my father had these larger themes and lar larger consciousness issues of consciousness that he was very embedded in and indebted to. Well, so, one of the main topics when I read your father's book, mm -hmm. and I'm reminded of Krishnamurti and the mm -hmm. studies that Emily and I are involved with, and our friends, uh, as are you, that this idea of self mm. is the greatest addiction. Mm -hmm. to ignorance yes it um this idea of identifying with a me mm -hmm. with a i with my opinions with my mm -hmm. judgments these are the things that separate us from each other mm -hmm. and separate us from our own sort of direct awareness of of mm -hmm. a of a body mind and a consciousness mm -hmm. so your dad very much spoke to that yes and uh this is sort of, um, have you changed your idea of Fred Wilson self-image over the years? You know, I, I guess so. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, 
you know, I'm not someone who, who kind of, uh, you know, think about myself image so much. I just do what I do. And, uh, but you sound so much like my father <laughs> just, just then. <laughs> it was amazing. I'm, but, I'm uh, glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that yeah, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you and I both didn't have a lot of time with our fathers. Yes. There were other figures in my life, but um, mm -hmm. not a lot of time mm -hmm. with the biological right. dads. Right, right. Um, so I'm, I'm glad when we can, we can invoke uh, yeah. their spirit. Yes, yes, yes. And particularly in this uh, sort of transcendental, transcendental uh, context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is anyone else? I, I just, have a, yeah, yes, does I, it, I just wanted to say that Adele wrote in the chat that you oh. can find more images of the LaGuardia oh. project on More Art Plus website. And, oh, yes, the sponsors of the project, yeah. And the Public That's Art Foundation. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I'll you, write Adele. that down myself because I didn't know. <laughs> and, Great. and yes, are there any, does anyone have a question? Or a comment? Or a yes, comment? really. I like how with Ron Smith, he's always in he's contemplation. And I feel there's a <laughs> pregnant something on his lips that's pregnant. <laughs> I do. I, I have something of a question for Fred. Oh. And that is um, <clears throat> oh. the work, the work um, is very powerful. And part of the reason it's powerful is the context mm -hmm. in which it's presented. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the work if you move it into another context? Right. For instance, the pieces that we just saw with the enclosures and the mm -hmm. figures inside, mm -hmm. what would happen if that was moved um, you know, to Minnesota mm -hmm. or someplace else? <clears throat> Is that... Uh, it's sort of a silly question, um, only in that your process seems to be so embedded mm. in the physical place you're in. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still a question of what, for me at least, what happens when the context is changed. It's shifted. Well, I mean, that's interesting, uh, specifically around that particular piece. Mm -hmm because it, it wasn't only the shifting of it. Um, different different people had very different responses to it because a, a mm. lot of people, a lot of people, you know, that's their outdoor space. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, some came back and back and back. Others wish it would go away. And so, you know, uh, it's because it reminded them of something... Uh, you know, something traumatic. traumatic yes, right. and uh, so that that's uh, that was something that uh, because I hadn't done something in the public sphere to, to quite to that degree. You know, I didn't uh, didn't realize that uh, until after the piece came up, and and that there's a lot of other, you know, what I was thinking about and uh, the ideas that I was trying to put forward. Uh, uh, you know, there was uh, quite a variety of ways of of uh, thinking about it, mm -hmm. and also people's experience with, you know, incarceration. Say, uh, it it really, uh, you know, people either really felt they got it, or they felt really strongly about it, or they felt it was just a little bit too much of a a memory. Um, and so, you know, that was something like a learning experience for me uh, because it was well, more abstract for me, even mm -hmm. though I yeah. was in prison, in a prison with my stepfather, who was a tailor. And he he went into the prisons when I was a teenager uh, to teach tailoring and dry cleaning to the inmates so that when they got out, they, they'd have something to do. And I would go with him. And all those gates and fences is something, you know, embedded in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also embedded in people coming by who's in their minds, too, of, of that experience. And uh, so, 
you know, it, it's, it's, it was a learning experience for me as well. You remember the Walker Museum in Minnesota, in, oh, yes. in Minneapolis, right. with right. The, the gallows, uh, Emily mm -hmm. uh, and, and Sally very vividly uh, were there in that, mm -hmm. in that experience. Uh, what do you what do you remember about that, Fred? How did, did you learn something from that? Uh, I I I I don't know that I did because I don't know. Uh, well, I, it didn't sound like something I would do, but uh, it is. I just understand that it's you know uh, a, a tricky. It, it gets kind of tricky if you really, you know how you know people have their perspectives and their own life experiences and uh so um i don't i don't want to i don't i know that the artist i don't know him personally but uh you know uh yeah he felt very strongly about it but um i just think that it has to be a learning experience and if if uh, if it's if something is is being understood as completely opposite of how how you intended it there there uh there, there could be some way to uh to reflect on it and and improve it uh or um re really consider the context beyond the human context beyond the kind of uh metaphorical uh uh context and because people have different experiences and, and maybe also can't, you know, not used to a visual language that you have to sort of, you know, dissect. But again, we we had, with that particular project, we did, and there were a lot of interesting groups uh, that came that, uh, and one was a group that um, are either previously incarcerated or incarcerated, uh, um, folks who were who were back and forth between that system uh who had a very good experience with it although some there's at least one woman who um you know they were concerned that it would re-traumatize her and i had totally not understood that she it turns out she was fine with it but you know it was just way outside of what i was thinking about with when i made the work and it does make you s slow down and think. Well, in the public sphere, you know, it's it, it's it can be seen in any any manner of ways, and you have to sort of accept it and understand: is this a direction you want to go in? Is this is this is this uh, an overpowering uh, you know kind of uh, something over that overpowers it that I have no control over in a public environment? So so do I want to do that? Or do I want to keep it uh, as a, you know, to the to an experience that you don't just come across and you have no, you know, you're control. not expecting anything. No control, yeah. No control, and they have no control if there yeah. are people coming to see it. So, and, and, and Fred, let's face it: after this COVID pandemic, people are so triggered. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, there's so much, yeah, you know, trauma that that's buried and sort of coming out in these bizarre ways mm -hmm. just you know walk down the street of manhattan and bicycles going this way, that uh, way. Uh, it's it's uh me started yeah no it's it's um it's a formidable uh time of uh ripe mental breakdown right right know? right right and understandably yeah i think with the piece you mentioned john at the walker art center that piece, um, the Native American community, I think they all agreed yes. to burn it. Right. And right. so I think that's an interesting res I, the artist also agreed. Yeah. And I think he um maybe sold them the work for like he gave over the rights. Uh-huh. Right, right. I may not have everything perfect, but I find that a really interesting resolution. Yes. To be going through that process. Right, right. <laughs> it might have been preempted had he begun with the community in the first place. Right. I mean, that was also partly the museum. Uh -huh. Yeah, the museum. The walker was, yeah. yeah. 
But this is the thing, Fred. We're we're, we're separating ourselves into silos, mm-hmm. and we're not uh, sort of seeing the common ground. Right, right. Uh, and these are examples, you know, where that these friction points are right. occurring that might otherwise have been anticipated, and a healing, mm-hmm. a healing could have happened for 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 all parties. Right, right. But it just how it's it was handled. Interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is this is what we're working with now. These materials mm-hmm. of uh, psychic disorder and mm. uh, disruption to our social fiber. Right, right. It seems to be institutional and sy- systematic. Mm-hmm. So one asks oneself, you know, where is the subversive activity occurring? Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, within the cultural community or, you know, within the industrial community that mm. seems to be um, causing quite a lot of uh, mm-hmm. violence and destruction. Right. Um, but John, John <clears throat> I want to, I, I also think it's a good question to for the artist to ask, how much responsibility does he or she right. want or need to take on around the um, reception of the work that's mm-hmm. being creative. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems to me that if you try to take on too much responsibility for how it's going to be received, yeah, you're yeah. in a way, sh- yeah, you're cutting yourself off or shooting mm-hmm. yourself in the foot or mm-hmm. you're compromising the work. Mm-hmm. So um, it's an interesting ongoing question that I think all of us face as we create work, mm-hmm. you know, per- personally, publicly, um, wherever mm-hmm. is this something you've been thinking about ron uh yes quite a bit actually are you will you develop some writing about it um i'm not ready to do that yet it's it has all sort of grown out of the recent trip i made to india mm-hmm. and it's going to take a while for me to to put some of those pieces together so I, eventually something will come out, but um, I'm not at the point to put pen to paper right now. Mm-hmm. When, when we climbed on the bridges in 1977, <laughs> several people said, you know, there are guns on those bridges. You could be shot. Uh-huh. And we took the risk. But I dare say if we did something like that today, time and place being quarterly different, context different, mm-hmm. Um well, there'd be a very, much different outcome, I think. Right. Mm. It right. wouldn't win the best news of the year. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah, I think there's... Um, I mean, one of the things that Fred Fred is also uh, offering us is this idea that the empathy um, that he has and has had with um, the so-called hierarchy and, um, you know, has also... Uh, given him extraordinary insight. And with that insight comes perception and a sensibility or sensitized Mm -hmm. body mind to intuitively find uh, just that perfect balance, Ron. You know, and and that's this sort of difference between being self-absorbed and being interactively um, Mm -hmm. interconnected. Mm -hmm. The interconnectivity I think is where we fail to uh, to really be thoughtful uh, beyond our own egos. Mm-hmm. Anyway, further further discussion for the yeah. institute and our spring uh, conference upstate run. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, Fred Thank by the you, way, Fred. Meredith lives. Thank Meredith you. Monk lives uh, in the town where we live, uh. and um. I just, we're trying to really enable that work to come up state. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can have it there one day for the suit students, Uh the um, multi racial, multi multicultural community up there. Uh Uh, Talk about changing the context. Right, exactly. Go ahead, Em, sign off. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your work with us, Fred. Sure. Thrilling. I so appreciate it. Um, 
thank you all in the audience. And John, thank you for your questions. Well, Adele yeah, says thank you from the chat. Renee it. says thank you very much. Wonderful talk and work. Oh, thank you. So, thank so, you um, so much. Just to, just to note, Ron, I, I didn't mean to imply that there was going to be uh, a conference of state, but I'm not saying that there won't be. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking the middle way, I see. That, that's how we roll, man. That's how we okay. Roll. <laughs> that, if that stone gathers a little moss, let's see how it goes. <laughs> okay, let's talk about it another time. You bet. Brad, thanks. You're a wonderful man. Oh, uh, thanks. Brother, always, we love you so much. Thanks, uh, Fred. Thanks, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Fred. So, and this will be on our archives, Emily, right? Uh, yes. In the next few days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll share it with you. Make it available. Great. Okay, great. Buonasera. Okay. Buonasera. Grazie. Ciao. Ciao. We we'll eat together soon, Fred. Yes. Good idea. Okay. In okay. Ciao, Margaret. <laughs> Ciao, everybody. I will. I will. Thank you. The Tuning Fork. Setting the tone for cultural activism through weekly encounters with cultural activists worldwide. Live on ICAI, Institute for Cultural Activism International.